local. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago and the wider world. Here's wishing you a great start to the work week and a warm welcome to the Ministry of Health's National COVID-19 Update for Monday, 6 September 2021. Today on our panel, we have Dr. Miriam Abdul-Richards, Principal Medical Officer, Institution, Institutions, Ministry of Health, Dr. Avery Hines, Technical Director, Epidemiology, Ministry of Health, and Professor Christine Carrington, Professor of Molecular Genetics and Virology, University of the West Indies. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, and I will moderate this morning's update. Dr. Abdul Richards will begin with the latest clinical update, followed by a presentation. Dr. Richards, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much, Al. Good morning to Dr. Hines and Professor Carrington. Good morning to all members of the media and all members, all, view, all persons who are viewing and listening to this media conference via the various media houses and social media platforms. Uh, this morning, I would like to present to you the information as per media release 838, dated Sunday 5th of September 2021, as well as a brief summary on the status of the hospitals within the parallel healthcare system. As of 4 p.m. on September 5th, 2021, an additional 227 new positive cases were confirmed. This takes the total active positive cases to 3,904, and these cases are distributed as follows. 3,299 persons in home self-isolation, 78 persons in step-down facilities, and 300 persons in hospital. There have been unfortunately 1,330 deaths and we would like to express our sincere condolences to the families of the deceased. As regards vaccination, 521,770 persons have been vaccinated with a first dose of a two-dose regime. As per completed vaccinations, the total number of persons vaccinated with a second dose of a two-dose regime is 407,768. The total number of persons vaccinated under a single-dose regime, 5,328. And the total number of persons with a completed vaccination regime, 413,096. And 96. Uh, I'd now like to move on to a st cl the clinical status update of the parallel healthcare um, system as per 8 a.m. this morning on September the 6th, 2021. So we will start with our graph which looks at the admissions and discharges. And we will see that there has been a narrowing um, which has been consistent over the last week between the orange and the green lines. Mm -hmm. And that shows that there are less persons um, being admitted or an additional a less burden on the parallel healthcare system as compared to two weeks earlier. The next slide shows the total number of admissions per week, and this number is at 43. And of course, this is for this current epi week, um, which started on the 5th of September. So we do look at this value over a seven day period. The Next slide shows the number of COVID positive patients, and that is an actual number who are hospitalized in the parallel healthcare system. And as of 8 a.m. this morning, there are 372 uh, persons in the six, across the facilities in the parallel healthcare system, with 291 in hospital and 81 in step down facilities. We continue to see the trend of a three to one ratio, meaning three persons in hospital and persons who are critically and severely ill to one person recovering. So there's a three to one ratio of severe and critically ill patients to recovering patients. And this again underscores the clinical severity. That is how ill people are once they contract the COVID-19 virus. The next slide demonstrates the overall percentage occupancy of the facilities and overall between if we looked at Trinidad and Tobago, 
the occupancy is at 36 percent a consistent trend since july 15th uh, with trinidad at 35 percent and tobago at 50 percent we also look at the average weekly percentage occupancy um, by hospital in trinidad and tobago and i'll move on to the next slide for this um, statistic and again a consistent trend in that the augustus long hospital remains the only hospital that has been above the consistently above the 75 percent threshold and this morning uh, just a marginal increase on the point fourteen hospital which is at 76 percent so we are consistently seeing the augustus long hospital being above that threshold and this morning, just um, a marginal increase at the Point Fortin Hospital. All our step-down facilities, of which we have seven in the parallel healthcare system, are under the 75% threshold. The next slide looks at the breakdown of ward level care and care according to the severity of persons within the parallel healthcare system. And you would notice that our ward level occupancy is at 34%. So let's say three. 0.4 or sorry 4 out of 10 beds are currently occupied while ICU is at 76 percent and HDU is at 30 percent again this is a trend that we have been noting and one for concern in that ICU patients continue to have um, the ICU occupancy continues to be high and that is at about 76 percent um, it again stresses that once a person contracts COVID-19 there is a risk of requiring care in a high dependence unit or an intensive care unit and those are the units that one a post patient will require ventilation and um, dialysis and other advanced levels of care the last slide shows the number of persons or patients presenting to accident emergencies in the traditional healthcare system and generally the trend we have noted is that these numbers are very low so um, in this case, and as of this morning, we have noticed um, low numbers yet again in the accident and emergency awaiting transfer to the hospitals in the parallel healthcare system. So, ladies and gentlemen, we continue to notice an occupancy level of under 40% in the parallel healthcare system. However, we continue to notice that there are children that are now being admitted for medical care as well as high occupancy and a high demand for intensive care unit treatment. We continue to do all our part, but it is important for you to please exercise personal, social and civic responsibility and to get vaccinated. Vaccination protects yourself. It protects the vulnerable persons around you who cannot access vaccination, such as young children, and it also prevents you and your relatives from requiring hospitalization care, especially in the intensive care unit and the high dependence unit, if you do contract COVID-19. Let us continue to follow the three W's, wash your hands, wear your mask, and watch your distance. And let us continue to please ensure that all of us are vaccinated. Thank you very much, Al, and I now pass you over. Dr. Hines. Okay, thank you, Dr. Richards. Good morning to Mr. Alexander, to Professor Good Carrington. Good morning to members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. We're going to go straight into the epidemiologic update with the first slide. Now we've reached the month of September, so we've added, next slide please, so we've added another color to the very right hand side of the screen, maybe not so easily visible at the side, but at the top, it's a sort of a brownish color. So we're seeing that the epi curve is showing that the sort of plateau, the relatively similar number of daily cases day on day from July into August into September continues. And that is also demonstrated by that rolling average, which is that dotted line moving through the background of the graph. And that's been holding somewhere around the high 100s, 180s, 190s to 200 over the past about eight weeks at this point in time. So that plateau maintains itself. If we look at the next slide, we see the same data on our weekly uh, aggregate time scale. And the colors remain the same. So the fuchsia color is July 
the indigo color is August, that orange color at the end is September. And for the first completed week, just about, for the completed epi week that is, in September, we're seeing that those figures look pretty similar to the weeks in August. You'd see that some weeks are a little higher than others, but not very much so, and there's basically an undulation. It's going up and down, but remaining around that a uh, couple hundred sort of, uh, sorry, in this case, a couple hundred per day kind of uh, average. And if we look at the background, that peach or salmon, uh, colored section of the background that is the positivity rate and that positivity rate has hovered between 25 and 30 percent throughout that time frame so we're seeing the delicate equilibrium between increased movement increased vaccination public health measures all of those things playing themselves out in figures remaining relatively constant over the past several weeks if we move to the next slide we see what that looks like on a monthly time scale. So this is a very good example of demonstration of what we mean by a plateau, where July and August have essentially the same total number of new cases at the end of the month. And we see again that that uh, background peach or salmon area has hovered or remained between 25 and 30 percent throughout that time frame. And uh, we continue to observe with care and with caution any trends as they manifest themselves within the epidemiologic surveillance of respiratory illness and COVID-19 in particular. If we move to the next slide, we see that the demographics, meaning the age and sex distribution, remain essentially the same. We're looking at about 50% men to 50% women across all of the positives. We're looking at that lower or bottom end of the pyramid being currently constricted based on the limited movement of school kids up to this point. And we're looking at the majority of the cases appearing in that 25 to 49 age group. And as we move to the next slide, again, we reiterate that among the fatalities, we saw more cases in the older age groups, especially those over 60. So more than two thirds of the cases occurring in that age group. We're seeing that it's about 57% uh, women, sorry, men and 43% women at this point in time. And that, again, we are reiterating that the important factors here are the existence of pre-existing conditions, which we call comorbidities. And against that backdrop, now that vaccines are available, the actual uptake of vaccines by those who have comorbidities has been shown to reduce the risk of fatality. And we want to, again, encourage all individuals, especially those with comorbidities, to make use of and to take up the vaccines that are available to reduce your risk of severe illness and possibly fatal outcomes. Moving to the next slide, the geographic distribution. Continue. Next, please. We see that we do have little pockets of higher numbers across several of the communities. But in general, we're seeing similar colors over the last few weeks. So this, this current map covers the completed weeks 33 and 34. And we do see that there are some areas, usually the more densely populated areas, that do have higher numbers of cases. But in general, we've been maintaining smaller numbers in communities over the last uh, few weeks. If we move to the next slide, we compare specifically week 33 with week 34, county by county. And if you look at the bar graph there over to the bottom left, we see that the purple being the older week, week 33, the gold being the new week, week 34. For most counties, we did see some small decrease, but then at the right hand side, we see that there was an increase in some of the counties and we are looking at that. So what, what we see is that decreases in some areas are then made up for sort of compensated by increases in others and that is, it results in that plateau. So we saw that St. Patrick's and George West, Tobago and Victoria also increases from week 33 to week 34, as opposed to Carolina of Mayaro, St. George Central, St. George East, which showed decreases. And that balances itself out to have similar numbers from one week to the next. Uh, but we need to look at, with care, the areas in which we're seeing those increases because we want to ensure that we adhere to the public health measures, we take up as much vaccination as possible, and in all the ways that we can, we try to reduce the risk of spread. Next slide, please. And now this is looking at each county from week 25 all the way to week 34. 
And we're just looking at sort of the trend from week to week. Uh, currently, we saw something of a downward trend from week 25, then more of a plateau thereafter. There of Mayaro, essentially a plateau. St. Andrews and David plateau, then a, a bit of an increase. So St. George Central undulating plateau more so than anything else. And if you look all the way across to the right-hand end of each of these groups of bars, we compare that same week 33 with 34, and we see the same thing that we spoke about, where some counties have an increase between the penultimate, that's the second to last, and the last bars, whereas others have a decrease. And that, again, evens itself out so that we see overall nationally similar numbers, but we are also looking at it at the sub-national level and encouraging all individuals to adhere to the public health measures, access the vaccines, and make the best use of all of their knowledge on how to prevent the risk of spread. Now, one thing that we would like to point out as we move towards the uh, opening, hopefully, of well, the school has opened and we look towards the vaccination of that school age population. We want to continue to encourage the school age population, the parents of those children, to make use of the available vaccines and uh, to get their kids vaccinated as quickly as possible. Looking at the uh, promised uh, increase in interaction for certain age groups, if they're fully vaccinated, looking at the ability to actually get back out into some form of limited face-to-face uh, -face interaction with full vaccination on board, please make use of the available vaccines as quickly as possible so that you are in time, so to speak, to access that available face-to-face -face option when it becomes available at, at the start of October. So with that, I'd like to turn you back over to Mr. Alexander. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. A release from the Ministry of Health yesterday advised the nation of a sixth confirmed case of the COVID-19 Delta variant, variant of concern. The presence of the Delta variant was confirmed via gene sequencing at the lab labor laboratory of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, UWI. Professor Carrington is here to speak with us about COVID-19 variants and what we here in Trinidad and Tobago can do to protect ourselves and our loved ones. Professor Carrington, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Alexander, and um, good morning to all. Good morning to Dr. Richards and uh, Dr. Hines, and good morning to the listening and viewing public. Now, to start off, I just want to tell people that, you know, viruses are very peculiar organisms, right? They are peculiar because they can only multiply inside of a living cell, inside of an organism. This is very different from other types of germs like bacteria that can multiply out in the environment. Viruses cannot do that. They enter your cells, they present your cells with their genetic material, and that genetic material sort of reprograms your cell to become a factory for making new viruses. And once you're infected, you start producing millions and millions of new copies of the virus. Now, occasionally, during the copying of that virus, you get mistakes being made, and those mistakes are called mutations. And what that, what, when, when you have these mutations occurring, you re, what the result is that the copy of the virus is sort of a slightly different version of the virus. And these sort of different versions are referred to as variants of the original virus. Now, most mutations have little or no effect on the properties of a virus, so that the, what we call the lineages of the virus that contain those mutations, they behave very, very similarly. However, occasionally you do get mutations arising that can change the virus's properties. For example, they may allow it to spread more quickly from person to person. They might make them more resistant to vaccines or they might cause more severe disease. Okay, so um, you, you end up with a, with a version of the virus that has different properties. And some of these properties are obviously of public health concern. And so those t viruses that have those, those variants that have those properties, they're referred to as variants of concern. Can I have the first slide, please? There are now four of these variants of concern uh, recognized by the WHO. There's alpha. Um, it is noted for its increased transmissibility and association with more severe disease. And it has been detected in samples collected in Trinidad, but there is no evidence of community spread to date. All of those individuals were, um, did not, there was no ongoing infection from them. There's also beta, which um, has not been detected in Trinidad and Tobago to date. And then we have gamma, which is noted for being more transmissible. And there's some evidence of increased
increase, so increase death. Um, but most vaccines retain their effectiveness against gamma. And this is the only variant of concern for which we have evidence of community spread in Trinidad and Tobago. And then finally, we have Delta. Delta is now uh, the dominant variant in many parts of the world. It is known for being more transmissible. It's associated with higher rates of hospitalization and death. And uh, there are certain vaccines against which it has reduced, um, there's a reduced ability for the vaccine induced immunity to prevent non severe disease. But the, these vaccines retain their effectiveness against severe disease, even in the face of Delta. So this variant has now been detected, as, um, doc, as Mr. Alexander said, in six samples from Trinidad and Tobago. Again, all of them were quarantined individuals. And so far, we have no evidence of community spread of Delta in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, all of these are called variants of concern because they've demonstrated those properties I mentioned, increased transmissibility or uh, more severe disease and, uh, and death, or a decrease in the effectiveness of um, public health and social and therapeutic or diagnostic measures. Um, in addition to these, the WHO also recognizes five variants of interest. Can I have the next slide? So the variants of interest now, these are variants that carry mutations that, can either, that are either predicted or known to affect the virus's characteristics characteristics such as those that I described for the variants of concern. However, the difference here is that unlike the variants of concern, they have not actually been shown to be behaving differently from the parent virus. So they have the characteristics that warrant monitoring, but more research is um, required to determine whether they are really variants of concern. The newest addition to this list down the bottom is the mu variant which was first identified in Colombia in January 2021 and has now been reported in 42 countries, including a few Caribbean, country, um, Caribbean islands. Mu is of interest because it has a number of mutations that suggest that it may be more resistant to vaccine immunity, but further research is needed to confirm this. And so far, there's no um, data to suggest that it is more lethal or more transmissible. So there's more research that needs to be done on mu. So it's being monitored. Mu, as I said, has not been detected in Trinidad and Tobago to date. Neither have any of the other variants of interest. They are, however, present in the Caribbean. Now, there, I want to move on to a few misconceptions that I'd like to address. Can we have the next slide? The first misconception is that because vaccinated people can get infected, there is no point in getting the vaccination. This is wrong because infection is not the same as disease. Infection means that a virus has entered your body and has begun to multiply in your cells. That multiplication of the virus can cause damage either directly or indirectly. If enough damage is done, then you will feel sick you experience disease. So infection and disease are not the same thing. Not all infections lead to disease, and in cases where there is enough damage to experience disease, the extent of the damage will determine whether you have mild or severe disease, or uh, in some cases, whether you live or you die. Now, like all other vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines were designed to protect against disease, not infection. And they are actually doing a fantastic job of preventing disease. Data from around the world shows that when vaccinated people get infected, they are less likely to experience disease. And if they do, the disease is usually mild. Also, vaccinated people are very unlikely to experience uh, severe disease and extremely unlikely to die if they are infected. So the COVID-19 vaccines are keeping people alive and they're keeping people out of hospital. Additionally, on top of doing the job they were asked to do, the job they were designed to do, they do reduce infections. Vaccinated people can get infected, but they do so much less often than unvaccinated people. Right? So the, the vaccines actually have an, a sort of superpower, something more than what they were asked to do. The second misconception is that there is no point in taking a vaccine if there are variants around. This is also false. 
even though some variants are more resistant to vaccines and, and um, you, they can cause disease in vaccinated people, the vaccines we have still massively reduce the chance of severe disease and death. Unvaccinated people are more likely to get infected with variants, more likely to experience severe disease and more likely to die than vaccinated people. The third misconception is the idea that vaccination is the reason why we have variants. This is also false. First of all, if, um, if you recall the slides I put up before, all of the variants of concern and the variants of interest currently in circulation emerged before vaccines were widely in use. So they cannot have been the result of vaccination. Second, you will recall that variants um, uh, they result from mutations, and mutations occur when the virus is in a cell being copied. So you can only get these mutations when you have infected individuals, right? So the more infected people there are, the more chance for variants to arise. COVID-19 vaccines reduce the chance of infection, and they also reduce the chance of, of um, transmitting the virus to someone else. They don't eliminate it completely, but they certainly reduce the chance. So although vaccinated people can transmit virus to other people, studies indicate that they do so much less often than, vac than unvaccinated people. All right. So the more vaccinated people we have, the fewer new infections we will have and the lower the chance of additional variants arising. So just to end, I just want to remind you that your immune system is like an army and the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus which causes COVID-19, is the enemy it has to fight. If you have an army that has to fight an enemy, would you want your army to know something about the enemy in advance, get a glimpse of them, work out the best way to fight them, train and prepare a stockpile of the best weapons to fight that enemy before they meet the enemy? Or would you prefer your army to just wait for the enemy to arrive and then learn about them as you are fighting them. If you are unvaccinated, your immune system is going into the fight blind, learning about the enemy as it is fighting. The enemy is causing damage and the enemy is multiplying as you are fighting them. Right now, for every, um, for one in five people who have to fight, unvaccinated people who have to fight the vaccine, going in blind with an untrained immune system, um, one in five of them will end up with severe disease, one in 50 will die. Vaccines allow your immune system to get a glimpse of the enemy and prepare in advance. Your immune system can prepare all the right weapons, the right B cells, T cells, antibodies. So even if the fight comes to you, even if you get infected, you have the advantage and you're much, much less likely to get sick or die from the attack even if the enemy is a variant that looks slightly different from the opponent that you trained for. Also, if you are vaccinated because your, 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 your immune system is better at handling the vi virus than an unvaccinated person, the number of enemy soldiers that get away and go on to fight other members of your family is lower than if you are unvaccinated. So I urge you to get vaccinated to protect yourselves protect your families, protect your country. Uh, that's, uh, I just, you know, I can't emphasize it more. Please get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Carrington, especially for that military analogy. <laughs> I know it goes down well with, with many military persons. And thanks for clearing up the misconception of the variants and reinforcing the importance of getting vaccinated. We now move to the question and answer segment. We once again remind our media representatives to state your name and the name of the media house that you represent before asking the allocated two brief questions. Please ask both questions, one right after the other, to the relevant member of the panel. And of course, if time permits, we will facilitate a second round of question, one question per media house. We begin the question and answer today with Radio Tambrin. Radio Tambrin, good morning. Yes, good morning, Clayton Clark, Radio Tambrin. Um, two questions. Um, this one is from a 
from the public um, responding to or seeking clarification on some statements made by Caribbean Airlines Corporate Communications Manager um, in an interview last week, where according to the reports, um, she said that it takes 54 plus hours of being on an aircraft with the virus before it can be transmitted based on how airplanes are sanitized and what it takes and what it takes when it, when it is airborne. Um, just seeking some clarification on that comment she made. She was saying basically, you know, it's it's safe to travel on, on planes with persons. I, I heard the statement, so I'm just supporting the, the question as well. Um, so I hope I was clear with that. And the second, second question, question. Yes, go ahead. Um, I know, a, well, there's been a lot of questions about physical activity and how it may be impacting or lack of it impacting the you know the, the impact of the coronavirus has uh, is there an update on in terms of physical therapy uh, on and covid-19 in terms of there's more demand for physical therapy by persons affected is there a link between the two and um wednesday is actually world physical Ther therapy day so I don't know if any one of the medical personnel might have some advice to give the public in general and with specific to COVID-19. Thank you. I thank okay. you very much. I thank you for the question. Uh, now, the first bit of your question, uh, none of us present has actually heard the statement made by the Corporate Communications uh, Department of the Caribbean Airlines Group uh, directly. So we can't respond to it directly. Nonetheless, what we would like to remind everyone of is the fact that the protocols that are currently in place for reducing the risk of someone with disease boarding the airplane in the first place are uh, our main line of protection as we have travel in, uh, in greater numbers. So although we have travel in greater numbers, we do have the requirement to have a negative PCR test 72 hours or less before you board the plane. And there's a requirement to be vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, then you have to go into quarantine when you come off the plane. So all of these things help to reduce the likelihood that someone is positive on the airplane in the first place. In addition to that, the requirement for mandatory mask wearing while on the airplane further reduces the risk of droplets being uh, expelled into the air and inhaled by other individuals. So these are the things that we really do rely on to reduce the risk of transmission, even with enhanced air travel. But we do still want to point out that with the enhanced holiday travel that we have been seeing, with the activities that we've been seeing people getting engaged in, all the uh, parties, Labor Day, etc., that we know that uh, people have gone out to enjoy and come back, we do expect that we may see increased numbers of cases uh, in that returning travel group just as a result of the increased amount of travel and the increased, uh, the increased interaction among travelers uh, in a situation in a place where there is rampant uh, COVID-19 circulating. So if we do see small increases in the numbers or even moderate increases in the numbers, this is expected. And of course, we are hoping that the mechanisms we have in place to reduce the risk of importation do the job and to keep that risk as low as possible with respect to physical therapy uh again we haven't we don't have any data that that uh links the COVID-19 situation with any increase in demand for physical therapy at this point in time and as it relates to the restrictions for various interactions we do encourage all individuals carrying out whatever services they provide to stick to those public health regulations and we in that way would like to would, would like to believe that we can lower the risk of transmission even in those settings so hopefully that answers the two questions thank you thank you very much dr hines and i would want to remind our media representatives to stick to the two questions uh, we now move to azpnews.com good morning good morning prior bihari azpnews.com I have a query from a member of the public who, who is over six years old. She, she has um, um, immunocompromising conditions, so fibromyalgia, um, Schwarzschild um, syndrome, and, and um, she took 
AstraZeneca, she's fully vaccinated, but she did an antibody test recently, and it showed that she had no antibody response. So she wanted to know what is the situation as, um, in in her case, what can be done, um, and can can she get a booster shot? You know, what is the policy with the ministry? That is the first question. And my second question is, um, is for Professor Carrington. Professor Carrington, out of the variants of concern, the four variants of concern now, would you say that the Delta variant is, is the most infectious and the most fatal, and and should we should we be more concerned with that one than the rest of them? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bihari. I'll attempt to respond to the first question. Now, as always, we advise all individuals to liaise directly with their care providers in managing whatever their risks may be with respect to uh, contracting COVID-19. The testing for antibody response after having had the uh, COVID vaccine is just one way of verifying whether or not there is a level of immunity that has been built. And Professor Carrington can probably go into a little more detail but beyond the actual antibody levels, we do know that the immune system retains the memory of how to make antibodies when necessary. So antibody levels by themselves don't correlate completely to what your level of immunity may be. We would, of course, advise that all the other precautions be taken. And at this point, where booster shots are not yet part of the existing vaccine policy, that hasn't changed. So we will just want to advise that the additional precautions be taken as a, as a, a measure to reduce risk. I'll turn you over to Prof. Carrington to answer the second question. Okay, thank you. So, um, as you said, there are four variants of concern, and they all have different you know, characteristics, and some of them overlap. Um, the Delta variant to date is the one that uh, appears to spread most quickly from person to person, so it's, it's, it's often referred to as the most transmissible. So that is of great concern because it means that um, the public health interventions that you put in um, are not as good as they, you have to sort of double down on them in order to get the same effect. Um, an analogy that uh, you can use is that, um, you know, when you have these public health interventions trying to reduce the amount of transmission, it's like going down an up escalator, trying to go down an up escalator. Mm -hmm. And with Delta, that up, up escalator is moving faster than some of the other variants. Um, it has also been shown to cause more severe disease and death, so it is a concern in that area as well. So yes, Delta is a, a major concern, but I think what we need to focus on is the fact that SARS-CoV-2 is a major concern. Whether they're variants or not, the rate of severe disease and death by any um, lineage, any you know, version of the virus is significant, and and the the um, the how, how we can prevent infections. It remains the same regardless of whether it's a variant or not. So we need to take all COVID nineteen seriously, and act to try and reduce the number of infections. Thank you very much, Professor Carrington. We now invite one or three FM to feel your two questions. Good morning. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, two questions very quickly. Uh, the first one, are health officials keeping track of how many people have entered the country since the borders were reopened and how many of those would have subsequently been tested positive for COVID-19? And the second question, um, perhaps Professor Carrington, but anyone can answer. Are you able to expand more on the sixth Delta case that was reported yesterday? Would they have been in quarantine? How many contacts were there? And how long ago did they actually test positive for the virus? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, at last update, we had received a combination of nationals and non-national adults of about 14,222 returning to the country vaccinated. And uh, then we had approximately 1,000 or so unvaccinated kids 168 kids who were vaccinated because they're in the correct age group. And out of all of those individuals, uh, sorry, and we had 452 unvaccinated adults. And out of those, what we found is that we had more of the, the identifications of COVID-19 in the unvaxxed population as expected. We only had about 0.02%. So that's two hundredths of a percent 
of the total uh, vaccinated nationals coming back with any sort of positive test, whereas we had nearly 1%, 0.88% of those who were unvaccinated having a positive result. So that's uh, an odds ratio of about 42 times. They're 42 times more likely to have, to have been unvaccinated and then showing up with a positive. So that just gives you an idea, again, of how well the vaccines actually work to reduce risk of becoming infected in the first place, just based on our rough figures. So hopefully that answers that. With respect to the first part of the second question, the contact tracing, of course, for the that sixth case was very robust, and all of the primary contacts were quarantined, tested, negative, and we are continuing that follow-up of both the individual and the contacts for the requested or the required period. So once we have an identification of a case of COVID, the community or whether it is in a returning uh, national all of those procedures are always followed there's always very robust contact tracing and testing of the relevant primary contacts and secondary in some cases and uh, this is something that is part of the armamentarium of the public health system in reducing risk of transmission of any case of COVID-19 that is identified so hopefully that helps to clarify Thank you very much. Uh, we now go to the Newsday for the two questions. Good morning. Good morning, Newsday. Hi, good morning, everyone. Rihanna McKenzie from Newsday here. Um, of the six confirmed Delta variant cases that we have, um, we know that the confirmed case from yesterday is in isolation. Uh, but what is the status of the other five? Uh, are they on their way to recovery? Have anyone have, have any of them required ICU care? Also, can you say how many of them have been vaccinated? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. The cases or the persons who have been confirmed of being COVID positive with Delta variant were persons who were being quarantined. Um, as bec because according to the national policy on, vac on, on returning nationals, they would have been considered unvaccinated. Uh, all persons have been treated and managed in our parallel healthcare system, and some have been discharged and others are doing well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. Uh, we now move to Power 102. Uh, you can now fill your two questions. Hi, good morning, Gregory McGrenny from Power 102 FM and Boom Champions 94.1 FM. Um, my two questions, I think um, Dr. Carrington might answer, be able to answer the first one. Um, a lot of emphasis has been placed on vaccinating the population, but the health minister shared an article last week with the media in which um, Professor Andrew Pollard, who is head of the Oxford Vaccine Group, he told the members of the UK Parliament House of Commons that herd immunity is, in his words, not a possibility. Um, in light of the spread of the Delta variant of um, SARS-CoV-2. How does this, um, or does it now hinder the, the government's objectives, that's one. And two, um, given the recent revelation of the death of three vaccinated persons, there's been some chatter in vaccine-hesitant circles on social media about this. Um, is consideration being given now to reverse the stance regarding autopsies on COVID patients? so that the exact cause of death for these three vaccinated persons could be revealed. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the two questions. I believe I'll try to answer both of them, starting with the second one. Uh, at this point, there is no change in the policy uh, regarding the COVID-positive individuals and their, uh, their autopsy. That will remain as is. I'd like you though to just sort of restate or shorten or reframe that first question so I can respond to it a little better. I want to clarify exactly what is being asked. I heard you ask that the, whether the uh, comments on herd immunity uh, from the UK, the person who presented to the UK Parliament, will hinder or affect our, uh, our vaccine rollout. I'm not quite sure how that would happen. But just to answer that, first of all, herd immunity is a concept that I think people maybe are misunderstanding or taking out of context. Herd immunity, for example, is the ability of a vaccine or uh, the immune status of a population 
to be such that no one gets ill and, vac and illness does not transmit from one person to the next. For example, measles. When last have you seen a child with measles in this population or anywhere in the Americas? That's herd immunity. We don't see it even if a child, even if there's an imported case, there is no op there's no ability or opportunity for that case to infect other people because everyone around is immune. Now, even before you get to that stage, or even without reaching that stage, the value of vaccination in reducing the risk of severe illness, in reducing the risk of death, in reducing the risk of getting ill at all and then transmitting the illness, that value doesn't change in the absence of reaching that pinnacle of herd immunity. In fact, it becomes even more important that as many people as possible, and especially those who are vulnerable, get vaccinated because there is still some possibility for the virus to spread from person to person. And as an individual, especially a vulnerable one, you want to ensure that your own risk of severe illness and death is reduced to the greatest extent possible. And we have seen, we have shown, and we will show again, that those who are currently hospitalized or severely ill in ICU, and among those who have died, the vast majority, 99% in some cases, for especially among the deaths, would be among people who were not fully vaccinated. And those who are fully vaccinated don't constitute any large percentage, very small percentages, of the ill, the hospitalized, and the fatalities. So that's what we want to focus on. Uh, so whether the uh, foreign person says that we, we are unlikely globally to reach herd immunity or not doesn't impact on the importance of and in fact the necessity of the population to get fully vaccinated or get as vaccinated as possible to reduce your own risk and to reduce the risk of transmission in the population as much as possible. Hopefully that clarifies. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Uh, we'll now take questions from Tobago Channel 5. Good morning. Good morning, Candace Jackson from Tobago Channel 5 News. Um, my questions are for Professor Carrington. How present is the gamma variant among the population? I don't know if you could give us just an average or so. And um, how long do you think before the Delta variant may become um, transmissible in the community? Okay, so um, with regard to your first question, um, we, when we do sampling for, um, so you have people in the population who are infected by the virus and some of those people, their samples will come to the University of the West Indies in order to determine what, what sort of, um, what type of virus they have, what, whether they have a variant or not. And so far of the samples that have been coming to us and more recently, the vast majority are gamma. Okay. The only other ones we've seen are those six Delta cases, which, as you heard, are all quarantined individuals. And there's another lineage, which is um, not a variant of concern that we've seen as well. So the vast majority are gamma. That is what appears to be the major thing circulating through now. But I can't give you a number because we, we don't have those. Um, I don't have those details. I don't have I can't say, you know, X percent of cases or five percent of cases because the sample that we get is not necessarily random. When you have someone coming in on a flight and they test positive, you want to deliberately go and, you know, test all the other people that they've interacted with, um, you know, the, the, their other contacts if they're not if they haven't been quarantined. And so um, it's not a random sample. So I can't give you that number. In terms, your next question was about the chance of the Delta spreading in the community. So we have people um, coming in, some of them um, test positive. As you heard, the unvaccinated are more likely to test positive um, after arrival, but the unvaccinated are quarantined. So already you've lowered the chance of getting um, Delta spreading um, from those people coming in. However, you could get an unvaccinated, uh, a vaccinated person might get infected. The chance is much lower and they might come in and, you know, spread it to someone else. But we, the, the aim is, as, as Dr. Hines said, is to reduce the chance. So we're doing everything we can to reduce the chance of uh, these importations spilling over into the community. Um, it does not mean that it cannot happen. And so that is why we have to continue to practice all of the interventions that we've been practicing before and also to get vaccinated. Because if and when it does happen, we want to ensure 
that our chance of staying out of hospital and our chance of remaining alive is as high as possible. Thank you. And just to tack on to the response by Professor Carrington, individuals traveling back, even those vaccinated who didn't have to go directly into quarantine, yes, yes. are still advised to monitor their own health and to some extent to limit their interactions and their movements, uh, unnecessary ones, as much as possible in the first couple of weeks after coming back if at all any symptoms of respiratory illness show up after you've returned from foreign travel, then we encourage you very actively to go and get swabbed because the probability of it being a COVID infection is reasonably high given the level of circulation of COVID-19 in the populations that our Trinidadians are currently visiting. So we want to encourage anybody with any kind of flu-like symptom coming back from foreign travel, even if you are vaccinated, please go get swabbed as quickly as possible and then follow up with the public health professionals in terms of isolation, uh, identification of contacts, quarantine, etc. just preemptively, even before any identification of a variant or otherwise would be made. So this is a, a, a plea to have those who do travel back aren't quarantined because they are vaccinated still follow or demonstrate a level of enhanced caution uh, in their activities and a level of enhanced uh, suspicion in any kind of flu-like illness that they may develop. Thank you. Uh, we now go to Guardian Media for your two questions. Good morning. Good morning all. Uh, Kevin Feldman, Guardian Media. Um, over the weekend we saw a lot of people in, in South Trinidad coming out for the Pfizer and Janssen vaccines. Um, so, Dr. Heinz, can you say whether there was an increase in people coming out to take these vaccines? And how well is the administration of these vaccines going, given that the Pfizer is due to expire uh, soon? And also, are there discussions with stakeholders regarding um, the implementation of seed zones for vaccinated people? Um, what is the Ministry of Health doing, um, based on the announcements by the Prime Minister? And as an epidemiologist, can, can that really work? Can vaccinated people really operate in a safe zone with the current infection and vaccination numbers that we have? Okay, Al, how many questions is that? <laughs> right, I'll, I I'll, four. I, it seems like it, right? I'll try to ad address the, the, the key things. Again, let's go backwards. The vaccine safe zone concept. Now, the, the safe zone concept is one where we try to facilitate additional mobility, movement, uh, for leisure type activities among individuals with a lower risk of A, being infected, or B, being infectious, meaning being able to transmit illness. So it's almost like you're creating an artificial pocket of herd immunity by having all the people in a particular space vaccinated while they interact. So theoretically, it is one of the approaches that can reduce risk. It will not clearly eliminate risk altogether, but it is an approach that can reduce risk by having a lower risk cohort or group of individuals interacting in these settings. So from an epidemiologic perspective, yes, it's an idea that, that is supported, and the more people that are vaccinated, the better the idea will work. Moving backwards to the question on the uh, vaccination using Pfizer. We do note that in the first couple of days when we introduced the Pfizer for children, we had above 3,000 vaccines per day uh, being taken up. Then it dropped to a little under 1,000. It has gone back up to about the 1,000 per day or so. We want to encourage all individuals who wish to get the Pfizer vaccine to make, uh, make haste to get their vaccinations on board because those vaccines do have an expiry date of about the end of November. So given that it's about a five week time period from first vaccine to full immunity, we want to count backwards. And despite by September and October, as many people as possible should be making use of the availability of those vaccines in order to make uh, full use of the available stock prior to any, uh, prior to the expiry date becoming an issue. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Uh, we do have a follow-up question from Rito Tambrin. Rito Tambrin, we're ready for your follow-up question. Yes, good morning again. Follow-up question, uh, how has the enforcement of home quarantine and isolation regulations been coming along? And, uh, 
how much is the breaking of those regulations contributing to the spread of the virus? That's an interesting question. Uh, clearly, the breaking of any quarantine regulation will contribute. We can't see the extent to which it does because you're not always aware of when an individual decides to break quarantine. It's not like they, uh, they have an RFID chip uh, under their skin letting you know when they're moving outside of the prescribed or proscribed areas. So home quarantine in general has been working well. There is an element of uh, an honor system where we expect that individuals who have been instructed to quarantine will follow those instructions. There is enforcement available from the TTPS where uh, we are aware that individuals may be tending to or demonstrating the tendency to breach. But we can't police everybody and we expect grown adults to police themselves, especially with something as serious as COVID-19 is, uh, is the fact that, it, that we're policing. So yes, if people who are supposed to be in quarantine breach quarantine and I just want to go to the grocery, I just want to go to the pharmacy, I just want to go see a friend, that will most certainly contribute. And we know that there is some element of that that is in play. And we see that playing itself out in the numbers as they fluctuate up and down over the, you know, from day to day and from week to week. We have increasing levels of vaccination. We have increasing levels of movement. And we have that uh, factor of individuals who shouldn't be in play or in, in, in circulation, being in circulation. Each thing that we do to reduce the risk each individual that makes a sensible decision to reduce their movement when they are asked to do so, each individual that takes the choice to vaccinate, each individual that follows all the public health guidelines, is an individual that helps to reduce the risk of transmission and to help us to get down to lower numbers on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is the call for all individuals to do all of the right things together to help us to reduce the level of transmission that we're currently seeing. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Our final follow-up question goes to Power 102. Hi, Dr. Hines. I'm um, following up to the, the second question that I asked. The reason I asked about the autopsies is that I was curious about the impact of these um, autopsies in terms of the COVID death figures. So, for example, if a COVID-positive patient is warded and they have comorbidities, and let's say, for example, they die of heart disease or kidney failure, are they still listed as one of the COVID death statistics? Do you understand my question? Okay, yes, question understood. That question has been asked before in various ways. And uh, the question, it was framed at once in such a way that we asked if we weren't over counting because someone with COVID that dies may not necessarily have died from COVID. And at that point, we explained that we were aware of this, but we still count any death in a COVID infected person among the COVID-19 fatalities that we, uh, that we publish. And it is not necessarily that they've died from COVID, but that it's an individual who has COVID-19 and has died. So we do count them in that manner in such a way that we don't miss any potential COVID deaths. That's the way, that's the way that we actually calculate that information and share it on a day-to-day -day basis. So hopefully that makes that clear. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines, and to our panelists and of course our media representatives for your very engaging questions. We have come to the end of today's media conference. Thank you for tuning in this morning. Please remember that the COVID-19 vaccine is an essential tool in the global fight against COVID-19, essential ammunition. Did I get that right, Professor? All right. <laughs> and, and it will allow Trinidad and Tobago to move from managing the virus to controlling the virus. Vaccinations continue to be the world's response to health threats as vaccines protect against sev the severity of the disease and, of course, death. And even if you are vaccinated, you should still follow the three W's, which is wash your hands, watch your distance, and wear your mask. The message is don't wait, vaccinate. And as we leave you, please stay tuned as we share a very important message from the members of the Trinidad and Tobago Defence Force and Protective Services. Um, so we go straight to the video now.